We know how this goes in the NFL offseason. You see this flurry of activity. You see trades, free agent signings, players release, all of this. And you'll have fans and media giving all types of opinions and reactions to it. You get overreactions to big signings. Oh my God, this is the greatest thing. My team's winning the Super Bowl. They won free agency, for God's sakes. Other team's fans saying, oh my God, my team is so fucking stupid. What are they doing? And sometimes fans are proven right and sometimes they are proven wrong. Just the nature of the beast. You know, it's what we do talking about the NFL. So Chicago Bears fans and the Chicago Bears media certainly are not exclusive in terms of their reactions and sometimes overreactions to everything that happens in the offseason cycle in free agency. But it is certainly worth talking about here. A couple of weeks into the offseason, a couple of weeks into the free agency period, the Bears, new general manager Ryan Poles, have certainly made some moves, uh, but I'm sure for a number of fans may leave them somewhat underwhelmed, surprised, perhaps even disappointed. Um, and it's leading to some negative reactions. You also have those fans that every move that the general manager makes is automatically great or awesome and it's immune from criticism, which is also in just inherently frickin' stupid. Sometimes you can look at signings or moves and you can say on the surface, this is stupid. Now, I don't know that you have any of those with the Bears, but let's not pretend like Ryan Poles has done anything to prove anything at this point. If anything, it is more fair to question until proven otherwise. Benefit of the doubt, especially for an organization like the Chicago Bears, should only be earned. It should not be freely given. They have done absolutely nothing to earn that right, and they have done nothing to earn that from you. As you look at this offseason, like, what do you make out of it if you're a Chicago Bears fan? Because they've certainly had some activity, but they haven't been major players. You know, obviously, the most notable signing that ultimately wasn't was trying to wrestle away defensive tackle Larry Ogunjobi from the Cincinnati Bengals to come in and play in Eberflus's 4-3 cover 2 system where you're picturing Ogunjobi as being that gap-penetrating three-technique defensive tackle. And that was going to be the first big notable signing of free agency until it wasn't because he failed the physical and now he's not here in Chicago. Which led to them quickly pivoting because certainly they had a backup plan in place and they brought in Justin Jones from the Chargers on a two-year, $12 million contract. Uh, not a name that's going to you know, wow you or anything like that, but another guy that fits the defense, fits the scheme. And if anything, I look at that Ogunjobi deal and I say, I think that's a blessing in disguise. Personally, personally to me, the number one goal of the offseason is to protect Justin Fields and get help around Justin Fields. Now, one free agency cycle alone is not going to fully accomplish that. But that has to be the aim here. That has to be the priority. That has to be the number one goal of the program. So yeah, I questioned a little bit, even though I understood because of the defensive scheme fit, because while the contract seemed big, it wasn't that big in the grand scheme of things. It was okay. I did question a little bit the fact of that this leadership, this front office, looked at the landscape of free agency and said their top priority was a defensive tackle. That is a decision, a philosophy that is worth questioning, if not criticizing. The number one goal of the program, again, is to protect and build around Justin Fields. It is not to build up your damn defense with guys that can play in Eberflus' scheme. You should have confidence in anything in the defensive-minded head coach that you hired, that his skills and talents as a defensive play caller, a defensive mastermind, should be enough to get more out of some of the talent that you have. That doesn't mean you totally ignore the defense in free agency. I grant you. But priorities, Ryan, priorities. However, I think some Bears fans are looking at this and they were expecting a whole lot more. And the reality is, you know, that this wasn't a great market for the Bears in terms of what they had in terms of salary cap space, where they were as a team, as an organization. This was not the offseason for them to go hog wild and spend a shit ton of money. It just wasn't. Now, I could certainly say, 
I personally would have liked Lyle Collins or Connor Williams, especially with the deals they ultimately got. Because as far as I was concerned, you have five positions on the offensive line and every one of them can be upgraded. And let's be clear here. This is a Bears team that was 6-11 and last year. This is not a good team. We need to get that through our thick skulls. And that means everybody, and I emphasize again, absolutely everybody, is potentially replaceable or free to be gotten rid of for the right situation, conditions, price, etc. Everybody. That's Jalen Johnson. That's Roquan Smith. That's Darnell Mooney. Yes, that even means Justin Fields. That doesn't mean you do it, but the point I'm getting at here is you can't show a bunch of player loyalty to a team that was fucking 6'11", that was so bad that both the head coach and general manager just got fired. That is insanity. You're not trying to build a playoff contender. You're trying to build a fucking championship contender, a Super Bowl winning team. And you ain't got it or close to it right now in Chicago. And the reality is, is because Ryan Pace is such a fucking idiot, he left very little cap space and flexibility for the Bears. Yeah, they had some, but it wasn't like they could go out on this major spending spree, and nor was that necessarily the right approach. Now, I've said before that the Bengals should be the standard that the Bears try to reach for in 2022 because the Bengals had a second-year quarterback, had weapons around Joe Burrow, and even with some of the gaps on their offensive line, had a middle-of-the-road defense, they made it to the Super Bowl. There's no reason you can't have that expectation, but also knowing that you could strive for that, but you don't want to go too far. But I look at some of these deals and I say, okay, there's a common theme here. Very little money invested, very little in terms of long-term investment there, which means that this Bears organization is setting themselves up to be significantly bigger players come next year which makes sense. Let's get a year in, see what Justin Fields is in 2022, see what the Eberflus defense looks like, and then you'll be able to take stock of where you're actually at, where you want to go, and how you've got to get there, and who you need to bring in to make that possible. But you look at the moves, even some of the moves on defense were solid. Justin Jones was a solid acquisition. Nicholas Morrow, one-year deal, could potentially play you know, either the strong side backer or maybe you play him weak side, but at least you got a strong side backer. You're not giving him much of anything, really. You know, maybe, just maybe you play him at the middle backer, which means you allow Roquan Smith to transition to that weak side backer, Darius Leonard type of role in this Eberflus defense, which is where he should be. You know, Al-Kadeen Muhammad, you, you needed a defensive end that could get some pressure off the edge, and they've got that here. You know, pairing him with Robert Quinn, so it's not bad. Offensively, yeah, I'm still surprised they're hanging on to Nick Foles. That seems like a dumb dick move. Uh, they signed Trevor Simeon to a really cheap backup deal. You know, I look at it and I say probably in 2023 you're using a day three pick on a long-term backup for Justin Fields anyways. That way you can invest in that important position and do so in a very economical way. Lucas Patrick is an upgrade at center over Sam Mustafer. That's a positive. Dakota Dozier... Equinemius St. Brown, those are depth guys. They may not even make the roster, but if they do, okay, cool. You didn't invest a ton in them. You know, arguably the best offensive signing they had was Byron Pringle, the wide receiver from the Chiefs. And even there, still a one-year deal. Bring them in and prove it. Now, I could certainly say that I would have really liked to see Cedric Wilson be added. I thought maybe O.J. Howard was worth a flyer. Would have liked to have seen him brought in. You know, especially when I saw that Shaq Mason came available for a day three pick. I'm like, oh shit, he, yeah, I had to smash a deal like that. Um, and then, you know, Robert Woods was ultimately available for a six round pick. It would have been okay to take on a $10 million cap hit this year and $13 million cap hit in 2023, because then you'd have a legit, at least number two, if not quasi number one, opposite of Darnell Mooney. But it wasn't to be. Yes, I would have loved to have seen them be more aggressive in terms of addressing the offense first and foremost. I can see Poles is trying to take a somewhat balanced approach here and be very methodical and strategic, and that's not a bad thing. Like you see the offer sheet they signed guard Ryan Bates to, and we're waiting to see whether the Bills match it or not. And you got a lot of Bears fans that are sitting there hyping it up like that's something great. You know, to me, it's like, okay, you're addressing the offensive line. This is a guy with some upside, but there's also probably a reason he wasn't a full-time starter in Buffalo. So let's not get too fucking crazy here. 
Meanwhile, you didn't address offensive tackle, and if you're going to say, well, you've got Tevin Jenkins and Larry Borum, like I said, you didn't address offensive tackle. I have more confidence in Borum at right tackle than I do Jenkins at left tackle, certainly at this point. But what did they show you last year that leads you to believe they automatically are the long-term answers at the tackle positions on that offensive line? Nothing. You're hoping, wishing, wanting, and praying. I would have liked to have seen them invest in that. You could say, well, they've got draft picks to do that, but they don't have a ton of them. As far as I'm concerned, I want to see them peel back from both second round picks and potentially the third round pick too. Acquire more depth of overall draft pick capital in 2022 and set yourself up better for 2023. That's what this team's priority should be in the draft. Uh, and when you look at some of the players that were gone, that are now gone, like, I'm perfectly fine with them letting James Daniels leave. He didn't fit what they wanted out of their offensive lineman, and James Daniels was overrated. Sorry, not sorry. And you can say, well, his deal wasn't that much, but yeah, was it even worth that for the Bears? Allen Robinson should have fired his agent a long time ago because he ended up getting wide receiver, high-end wide receiver two money from the Rams, which he was lucky, I guess, to even get that. But letting Allen Robinson go, that needed to happen. Bilal Nichols, yeah, it sucks because the Raiders signed him and won for a ton of money, but did he really fit as a three technique defensive tackle in this Eberflu system. And clearly they felt that he did not because it certainly wasn't price that was restrictive from retaining him. Damian Williams gone, but you still have Monty, you have Khalil Herbert, you're fine at running back for 2022. Perhaps the most head-scratching one of all is, why would you re-sign your long snapper for a year, Patrick Scales, and then let your punter Pat O'Donnell go to the Green Bay Packers? I realize that O'Donnell wasn't elite, you know, and some Bears fans love Mega Pump way more than he actually deserves to be loved, but how much money are you really saving here? Like, there are questions. My point is, is there are moves that I've seen from Ryan Poles that deserve some questioning at the very least? And I question some of the approach and philosophy here, that's for sure. But the signings are good in the sense that there are a bunch of low risk kind of flyers and one year gambles, and if they pay off, Great. And if they don't, that's great too, because you're going to have a shit ton of cap space and hopefully in 2023's offseason cycle, way more draft capital to play with in the draft if Ryan Poles plays the draft better than Ryan Pace ever did. This was not the time or the place to go make a bunch of splashy moves. Bears fans talk about, let's go bring in Tyree Kill and do what? That sounds great in theory until you realize you really want to invest $30 million in a wide receiver every year? As many holes as this damn team still has on both sides of the ball? I don't know about that. Now you saw Bears fans wanting Teron Armstead from the Saints. Why? So you could have a left tackle that's going to miss several games every year? Yeah, he's great when he plays, but that is a big motherfucking if! I'm sorry, but I'm prioritizing Justin Fields and protecting him, and I'm not doing that by signing somebody to five years and $75 million, of certainly a big number of that guaranteed, and then having to sit there and say, well, I got to also invest in a swing tackle. Like you would say the Lonzo Ball, Alex Caruso deals worked out for the Bulls as you invested somewhat big money in Lonzo Ball, but you also had to invest in Alex Caruso, not just because of what Caruso did, but you know that Lonzo Ball is fragile as shit and you're lucky to get 50 to 55 games out of him a year. See, this season. Do you really want to have that duplicity of investment at offensive tackle? I think so. Especially since when you look at it from a technical old school standpoint, the Dolphins gave... Teron Armstead all that money to play what is effectively a right tackle in Miami because two is a left-hander. I'm just saying, even though you could say the left versus right tackle thing is massively overrated in a day-to-day -way of thinking, it absolutely is. But yeah, the Bears offseason moves haven't astounded me. They haven't wowed me, but they haven't totally pissed me off either. I've got some questions about the approach and the philosophy, sure. And it's fair for me to have him because Ryan Poles has done nothing one way or another to earn benefit of the doubt, period. But for those Bears fans trying to sit there and champion this like this is a great offseason, you don't know. For those that are trying to champion this as being some type of disaster, also, you don't know. Two, what the hell did you want him to do? Three, with what cap space? Four, why? You moved on from Ryan Pace for a damn reason. I am willing, believe it or not, 
to be a little patient with Ryan Poles right now because I am aware of and appreciate the shithole disaster that he is inheriting in Chicago. You should be too.